Okay, welcome to lesson seven. How has Brexit reshaped UK politics? Now, uh, there's a lot to talk about in this, but actually I want to get straight to um, the relevant part uh, where you'll find me useful. The UK left the EU. Okay, uh, it left the EU when? That's the starter. Technically, it left on the 31st of January 2020. However, it is part of a transition agreement. We are no longer members, but we are transitioning from being non-members. And so in some sense, we are still kind of weirdly in and out of the EU. However, we did not leave on the 23rd of June and we did not leave on the 29th of March when Article 50 was triggered. We left on the 31st of January. OK, now, uh, if the following sentences make sense, you should remember your key terms, political sovereignty, legal sovereignty and popular sovereignty. And that sentence right there is a very complex sentence, but if you read it to yourself, it should make sense um, because it brings together those key terms. It's about the Brexit referendum and what it did, or supposedly did, for sovereignty in the UK. So we left the EU. Yeah, we left the EU. Um, oh, by the way, that's the actual explanation of what that sentence means. The reason I did that was to try and help you get to grips with the legal language. Um, and if you've understood that, you've understood what those terms of sovereignty are about. Um, We've left the EU. So some people might say, oh, why are we studying the EU? That's no longer part of our political system. Well, it still is to some extent because of our transition arrangement. And for Brexiteers amongst you, I'm sorry to say, it still will be even after not being part of the EU because there are lots of ways in which the EU has influenced our laws and probably will continue to still do so because it's such an important political institution and economic institution. So the Factor Tain case there is a really good case study uh, of EU um, of EU power and the way that EU law has influenced UK law. So you may want to check that out. Um, the link is there. It's a, in fact, I'm saying you may want to, you definitely should. It's to do with fishing, but believe me, it's super important. It's a great example of how EU law, when we were members of the EU, trumped UK law. And I mean trumps not in the sense of uh, the US president, but in the sense of uh, that EU law was supreme. It was higher than UK law. So even parliament, technically parliamentary law could be trumped by EU law. And you're going to see an example of that in the factor Tain case. Anyway, hopefully you got through this, uh, you filled it out. It all made a lot of sense. Um, this is not necessarily going to be, you're not going to necessarily want to evaluate the extent to which the EU has changed in recent years. You're not going to get that in an exam, but this is useful to know, particularly for component three, when we look at global politics, you're going to return to this. And it's really useful to know the different institutions of the EU as well as their four functions. Um, this is an important, important document. This here tells us what seemed like an eternity of Britain leaving the EU. And it's quite interesting to go through this, actually, because for you guys, you would have been growing up in 2016. You would have been from right year eight when the Brexit referendum happened. Um, maybe you would have been even younger if you were a younger year. Um, and ultimately what happened during those four years was a slow, slow process of us leaving the EU. And I'd like to use that to fill out your, there is a timeline because the timeline in your note taker, which looks like this, divides up what we refer to as impact on the UK government and impact on UK politics. I've given an example of, of one. So for instance, um, Boris Johnson taking the role of PM would go under UK politics because um, that was a change in the politics of the UK. Remember those first four units of our course that didn't necessarily impact the constitutional arrangement. Yeah, we got a new PM, but you know, it didn't have a constitutional math. It didn't have a constitutional um, impact. Whereas the triggering of Article 50 would definitely go in the constitutional arrangement because that was us. Uh, leaving the EU, removing ourselves from a trade agreement or a political agreement. And that, alongside the legal case alongside it, which we've been looking at um, with Gina Miller, those were constitutional matters. Those were to do with component two. So I'd like to try and fill that out, um, the timeline of Brexit, using this slide here. Um, but this is the bit I wanted to talk about. This is how has Brexit reshaped UK politics? And I'm going to talk a little bit about this freely because 
this is still to be discussed and you may watch this back in a year's time and think oh wow things have changed even more since then but the impact of brexit well the obvious impact socially was a rise in nationalism in the uk so the social impact a rise in national um, intent as well as also a rise in division amongst particular groups and communities we saw a rise in racist attacks upon um, marginalized communities communities like muslim communities that had really nothing to do with european membership but there was definitely a rise before and afterwards in uh, what we would refer to as racism or sometimes people refer to as uh, hostility towards migrants but you can find multiple examples of that um, there was also in terms of social impact a division between what we refer to as brexiteers and remainers um, and this became a kind of uh, new category you were a brexiteer or a remainer and the division particularly between urban um, centers like london bristol manchester liverpool and uh, suburban or towns um, such as Lee, well, let's talk about Bolton or um, Huddersfield um, where the vote to leave was far higher that division uh, was felt socially and also if we talk here about the country so Scotland um, Scotland voted to remain quite heavily over 60 percent whereas the whole of the UK voted to leave so that division between what Scotland wanted and what the UK wanted further exacerbated um, worsened relations and uh, the kind of agreement between Scotland and um, the UK Parliament that had come after what was quite a close referendum in 2014 for independence um, for Scotland so the SNP started banging the drum further for Scottish independence because they said well if we become independent now our will which was to stay in the eu could be uh, listened to whereas if we remain in the uk we're going to leave the eu so it it supported it um, enlivened it it fueled greater demands for independence for scotland in northern ireland there was a huge issue at play here because northern ireland is the only land border with the eu we are an island except we are not because we uh the UK is part of a shared island with the uh, Republic of Ireland who are a member of the EU and that border between the Northern Republic of Ireland uh, that border became a very big political issue Northern Ireland um, would become the border with the EU and so the big question was well if that's the border then do we start putting up you know walls or at the very least border checks which is something that the UK had stopped doing out of the Good Friday Agreement. Now, the UK stopped doing that because it caused tension between uh, nationalists and unionist communities in Northern Ireland, communities that wanted to stay part of the UK and communities that wanted to become independent or join North uh, Republic of Ireland. So the idea was get rid of the borders and people won't feel either way too annoyed because you won't visibly see the border with with republic of ireland but you know for nationalists that would be good but then for for unionists they'd feel good because oh they're still part of the uk so you kind of have the best of both worlds well once we leave the eu there was a sense that well you're going to need some borders with the, with the eu because we're going to want to check what's coming in and the eu are definitely going to check want to check what's going out and so what ultimately happened was the big question of what well, do we put borders back up in Northern Ireland and this is a question that hasn't been resolved but the ultimate point to be made here is that Northern Ireland Irish politics became even more complex um, because of Brexit and in fact it became even more complex because of the 2017 general election in which the DUP became the very important nine votes in Parliament that Theresa May's government needed to pass uh, their budget um, and exist and so the DUP which were a Northern Irish party became kind of super powerful um, in a way that actually didn't help Northern Irish politics um, because the DUP are a unionist party and it did not help nationalist parties who became or arguably became ignored by Theresa May's government over that issue constitutionally there were some big questions being asked about Brexit um, we saw the Gina Miller case we saw the case around prerogative powers um, and the question of what prerogative powers the executive could use we then saw Boris Johnson trying to close down parliament prorogue it for longer than it normally could have this would would have but this this couldn't have happened if it wasn't for Brexit Brexit certainly brought up some big constitutional questions and still does because a lot of our constitution 
is tied up in laws that we passed as member of the EU. So what happens to those laws? Um, certainly, I would argue, uh, Brexit brought about uh, constitutionally a greatening or an increase in powers of the sovereignty of the legislature. Um, Parliament became and, it, and still is far more active than it ever has been. Um, and this is one of the ironies actually of Brexit and probably will be looked back upon by many historians, which is that Brexiteers argued that Brexit should happen because Parliament needed to be sovereign again, the UK Parliament needed to be sovereign. But that happened in some senses quicker than they had hoped for because it happened almost immediately as Parliament stepped in to try and steer the process of Brexit and in some sense block certain demands of Brexiteers. So almost it was a question of be careful what you if, wish for if you're a Brexiteer because you wanted a sovereign Parliament well you blooming well got one and they blocked a lot of the attempts at no deal Brexit at, um, at kind of a quick Brexit or a hard Brexit whatever terms you want to use and they will continue to do so and this is potentially uh, not a story that's over uh, anytime soon the Conservative Party. Well, the Conservative Party were divided by Brexit. It's worth remembering that the Conservative Party have now had three prime ministers, three different leaders um, that have lost their job over Europe, um, and arguably many more than just three. So you could talk here about Margaret Thatcher losing her job in the 90s um, over Europe. You could talk potentially about John Major being battered by the issue of Europe over Maastricht. David Cameron, the next Conservative Prime Minister, definitely lost his job over Europe. He resigned the day after the Brexit referendum results, or very soon after. Theresa May lost her job over Europe. Um, and we now have Boris Johnson, who we, for now, thinks he's quite safe because of his majority in Parliament, but certainly will at certain times be challenged by this question. The Conservative Party have always been divided by Europe, but Brexit certainly um, has changed that in some sense. The Conservative Party now are a Brexit party, um, and particularly under the leadership now of Boris Johnson, whereas Theresa May had tried to brought, bring the party in some sense together over a kind of shared view of Brexit, she herself being a Remainer, but trying to bring the Brexiteers into her cabinet, like David Davis, like Boris Johnson himself, Boris Johnson was a Brexiteer, although we know the history of that was a little bit controversial. He wrote, kind of basically looked on both sides of the argument, decided to go for Brexiteer rather than Remainer, partly arguably because he saw a more political opportunity in it. Um, but the Conservative Party now is a Brexit party. It stood uh, at the last election without the Brexit party standing in its, it, its own seats that it was trying to keep, which is notably a kind of unspoken electoral pact and its leaders are certainly um <coughs> its leaders are certainly brexiteers now so if you look at the cabinet you've got um boris johnson obviously a brexiteer you've got pretty patel at home secretary a brexiteer you've got dominic raab foreign secretary a brexiteer um and the membership and the new mps certainly signed up to a manifesto that is a Brexit manifesto. So arguably, they've potentially become less divided over Europe than they were, but certainly under Theresa May, maybe even under David Cameron. The Labour Party have become divided over Brexit as well. And, and again, there's a lot of arguments that historians will make about this, but this the extent to which Jeremy Corbyn was weakened by a kind of division over Brexit within his party is yet to be established. I think it probably will be by historians that that the, that the Labour Party were as divided over Brexit as the Conservative Party, not necessarily in being pro or against it, but in terms of the priorities that Brexit uh, brought. So many within Corbyn's section of the Labour Party saw Brexit as inconvenient, not necessarily an issue to, you know, get onto the barricades about and fight the Conservatives over, but certainly inconvenient. They weren't supportive of Brexit, but they wanted to take power in order to change not just policies around Brexit, but also potentially policies around the economy, around health, around the environment. But Brexit kind of uh, ruined that Corbynite plan. Brexit got in the way of 
an attempt for the Corbyn, Corbyn's Labour Party to bring together Brexiteers and Remainers around a politics of anti-austerity, to say, don't worry about Europe, worry about Westminster, let's worry about our quality of living, let's worry about questions of inequality in the UK rather than worrying about a referendum vote. It tried to move beyond Brexit at a point in which the country potentially wasn't ready to move beyond it. Um, and Labour Party in the 2019 election particularly uh, paid for that. Um, Jeremy Corbyn losing his position as leader. <coughs> and we now have leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, who was an open Remainer um, and called for a second referendum, was clear and open supporter of a second referendum. So in some sense, that wing of the Labour Party won, won out on that debate. The Liberal Democrats were changed by Brexit, certainly because they redefined themselves. They redefined themselves as the the EU party. Um, their slogan at the 2019 European elections was bollocks to Brexit. Um, and they certainly took that very strong line of being an EU party, pro-EU party, um, the pro-EU party. And they came second in the uh, European elections, um, which they claimed to be a big uh, victory. However, as we know in general elections, people don't just vote on Brexit uh, or on the European Union in general, and their vote has not considerably, or their number of seats anyway in Parliament, have not considerably increased. So that gamble from the Liberal Democrats, we'll see whether it pays off or not. But certainly with the story slightly moving on with, with COVID-19 and the response to COVID-19, it may be that historians look back at that as a bad decision because the Lib Dems are now nowhere really to be seen on the current issue, the most important issue of the day, which is dealing with coronavirus. And that is most of the discussion uh, done, really. Uh, you may want to have a look um, at some of the articles, task D. Obviously, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts, um, particularly on the plenary in the comments. But do let me know um, any questions and I hope you all stay well. <laughs>